Hello and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Business of Property. I am your host, Cheryl Leon from Property Development Australia. At the Business of Property, we interview superstar guests in the property development space that share their expertise, their deals, their stories to help empower, build and grow our community of property developers and investors. So hello to Facebook land, LinkedIn, YouTube, wherever you're watching the live session today, feel free to hit the comment button, put your hellos in if you're here with us. Or if you're watching the re replay, not we pay, the replay, hashtag replay. So our guest for tonight is Brenton Seishi, who is an experienced investment advisor with a demonstrated history of capital raising and development with his company, Lion Property Group, which currently have over 20 projects um, in progress, whether in construction or in in different phases of the development life cycle. So Brenton um, began his career working in construction management before transitioning into capital raising. And the reason that we've brought him here today is to talk about this um, topic around managing risks, like development is risky business, right? And so how do we go around making sure that we highlight and are able to, to manage the specific risk world so that we end up having successful and profitable development um, project. So without further ado, hello everyone. May I welcome Brenton to the Business of Property dance floor. Hi Cheryl, hi everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Business of Property, Brenton. Um, and tell us a little bit about yourself and we want to find out those of, that haven't met you and they've probably seen you you know leave comments or provide some sage advice you know in or sage sharing of your experience in the group not so much advice share with us your property journey so far um in terms of my career show or in terms of my own developments and what i do in property yeah well your your own experience to start with and then we can talk about the 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 business side of your career yeah growth. okay cool um oh, when i was 18 obviously as you mentioned studied uh construction management um and I, at that time i was working offshore on the oil rigs at the same time i was also doing some scaffolding on the sky rises in the cbd so i was always involved in construction my dad worked offshore on the oil rigs as a crane driver um and i loved the construction side of it as well um and then I suppose shifting into your more developer side through, I got, got my real estate license. I um, did a bit of business broking. Um, I was day trading as well. Um, and then a junior grad position um, became available as an investment advisor uh, for a corporate finance company. I actually had no experience in that space because mm -hmm. it was more around the project management construction side than property development. Um, however, the, ASX and the equities markets um, and the share market, uh, they intrigued me. Um, so I took a took a plunge into that space and that's where I started, you know, sitting in boardrooms with CEOs of big private companies um, looking to uh, list on the Australian Stock Exchange and go public. Um, and to do that, they needed a certain amount of liquidity in the company um, and ASIC required them to have a certain amount of funds. Um, and to go to that next level, they had to do some capital raising. So I kind of mm. just fell into capital raising. Um, and then after a few years there, uh, Lion Property Group saw my previous experience, saw what I was doing now. Um, and, you know, I've been there at Lion Property Group for five years and never looked back since. Uh, it's awesome that I've been able to, I suppose, combine my experiences all together and uh, be in a position I am in now. Um, to you know, add value to situations that can help everyone. Yeah, fantastic. And I know um, you do. As, I mean, as part of your your role at, in Lion Property Group, because you are dealing with a lot of, lot of investors, and I'm sure this comes up very often, is that investors are a little bit nervous about putting funds into into development projects. So risk management and being able to advise them, you know, not advise. I would take a word away. There's no advice on this. <laughs> in, in this by the way and, and guide them through what it is that that you guys are doing in terms of your projects how you're managing the the types of risk as well 
Um, just at the gym, I'll watch this tonight on replay. Go, go hard. <laughs> go, enjoy. <laughs> enjoy. So as you're managing all these all these risks. So you're in the capital um, capital raising part, and I'm sure that you get the same sorts of questions day in and day out from in investors. What are the top five areas of risk that you see that developers need to really consider, um, particularly in the current market? So we've had a, quite a volatile market over the last two years. I don't know if anyone's noticed. Um, and <laughs> And there's always going to be some element of, you know, challenges that come up and things don't always go as they would plan. What are the top five areas that you feel are, are most critical for developers and projects? I'll, I'll start first by um, saying just in relation to the investor side of it, um, depending what level an investor comes in at depends on their um, risk and how they associate risk to a property development, something that they might see very risky um, to us. We don't really see it as a risk because we deal with it every day. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of in terms of the top five risk out there at the moment, they're always out there, but obviously some impacting um, more so than others. Uh, for example, interest rates. Um, but I'll start with in terms of top five. I'd put at the top of that land value. Um, I think as a developer, it's very important mm -hmm. that you're conscious about the value of the land that you're about to develop. Uh, yes, interest rates do impact that value, but can you get the highest and best use out of that land and add a significant amount of value to that land to make it all worth it? Um, yeah. And you can purchase land in and or find a good deal in any market. It's just about, you know, having the patience and, and you know, targeting the right bit of land or right deal at the right time which isn't always easy. Uh, deal origination is probably one of the hardest thing as a developer mm. um, if you want to, you know, be successful at it. So yeah. land, and are you, sorry, do you want to, should we so talk at each so, point or do you want to? Yeah, yeah, let's talk, let's talk each point and dive, dive a little okay. bit more. So, uh, you know, people sort of land value, what do you, what do you mean? How is that risky? And you're talking about the, the buying part. Yeah, um, the acquisition. You, yeah, the acquisition and how do you, um, what's the, what are the risks there? So firstly, say if you acquired a piece of land recently, and this no doubt is happening to a lot of the members at the moment. Um, it's happened to me recently, to be honest, where I've acquired a site, um, say five months ago now, in five months ago, in three months, I was about to settle on the site, but the site was no longer to the bank's discretion, no longer the value um, of what I actually acquired the site for. So, for example, I and this is hypothetical, if I purchase a site for six hundred thousand, uh, and you know I can go up to eighty percent, I would need you know twenty percent, one hundred and twenty thousand. However, if the bank now values that site at you know five hundred thousand, that's a whole yeah. another one hundred k I'll need on top just to acquire the site, which you know cash flow is crucial in these um, developments and. Uh, if you're starting off like that, it can be very, very difficult. Um, or if you acquire a site now and in 12 months' time it goes down, it, it can be it can be very challenging. So you just got to make sure the site you identify and to mitigate it, the site you identify, make sure you can make highest and best use out of it and make sure you've got the right consultants to mitigate it further, to make sure you've got the right mm -hmm. consultants providing you um, the information you require to ensure that yes, it's worth the risk of going down the path of acquiring the site and you know going to um, council with the proposed plans and and hopefully being yeah. successful at obtaining the permits. Yeah, and so this sort of stresses the need to ensure that you do sufficient due diligence yes. as to what's possible, and also I guess in terms of your feasibility, like uh, ensuring that it's not too tight. Co correct. Correct. Um, that you're not being too optimistic on the sellout or the gross realization yeah. value of the property. So what we are going to build and what it's all worth at the end, uh, we need to make sure that the there's enough fat in that project to, yeah. you know, or a big enough contingency in the project to make sure that it's worth doing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So you've got, you've got land as that risk. So that's even just at the, the very starting point. We haven't even started developing, developing it. Or building Correct. It. We haven't even 
touched any dirt. No. Um, and but we've 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 talked about this quite a bit in terms of the other um, episodes of the business of property, where it is around that due diligence and that feasibility and making sure that we've done all our research to ensure that the end end values and the end prices are not going to be overinflated. You know, it used to be that you put a number in a feasibility and you talk about, you know, what what it might be three or five percent by the time you finish, like scrap that, just put it in as it is now or potentially if it drops as well, because you need to have a little bit of contingency up and down, right? Obviously down. So right. does it still work? Does it still work? Are those numbers still at least 20% plus um, and not have them at 15% and hope that hope for the best? That's right. That's spot on. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, land value definitely um, up the top for me or finding the right site to make sure it's feasible and equitable and worth it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Number two, tops. Number top two, areas. I'd go with um, obviously going through council and everything and plans and permits is risky, but I'm going to associate that with the land acquisition and the planning phase. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, you know, make sure you're engaging the right town planners, the right people to give you the information you need to make an informed decision on whether it's worth going down that path to fight for that development. Um, mm -hmm. You know, do you need to push the boundaries a little bit to get it approved. So definitely risky. Um, make sure you've got the right consultants on board. Um, so I'm putting that under land value and then moving on to builder engagement and the builder yeah. you engage to develop the site. Um, there's there's so many risks associated with engaging and going into partnership because that's what you're doing. Um, yes, you're a developer, you might be your own, but you're actually going into partnership with this person and and it's a you know it's a you're going in for a two year minimum or say you know depending on the site but say two year two year minimum partnership and you've you're going to see each other at your worst and best times and you've mm -hmm. got to make sure you know each other well enough um, to to get through those tough times um, yeah crucial crucial uh, builder engagement and what are the key things in terms of that builder engagement It's not just around. I think the builder is a good person. <laughs> what are you know? What are the things that you need to do in terms of your builder due diligence, particularly when we're seeing a lot of builders going under? What what can developers do to at least check off and get some assurance that they've engaged the right the right building company? That's right. Um, so I'll just talk about what we do, at Lion Property Group. We'll bring a builder in at the inception stage. So we actually build, bring a builder in at the planning phase, engage them early enough, and that will help us along the way. And we'll have meetings with the builder and the architects to get the highest and best use out of that, out of that site from a practical and design sense, which helps us a lot. Um, not everyone can do that because they don't have those um, forged relationships, yeah. but it's definitely something we do, um, which provides, you know, an opportunity for value management and stuff like yeah. that to make sure that the site's feasible and equitable. Uh, in terms of, you know, selecting the right builder for everyday people, it's important just to, you know, talk to the builder, look at other sites they're doing, um, talk to the other develops, developers that they're doing the projects for, um, if you can talk to subcontractors they use, do them subcontractors mm. get paid? Is there cash flow? Um, there's a lot of DD you can do on a builder and it's definitely worth doing it. Um, building, developing, it's a fickle game. You want to make sure that you're you know, in bed with the right builder and, the, and um, you've done the right checks and done your DD because at the end of the day, you're paying a lot of money uh, for, for the building and the works and you want to make sure that you're going to get the result or the quality that you've you know, paid for. In terms of looking into cash flow and speaking to subcontractors, how do you go about asking for that? Because a lot of people sort of go, oh, that's, that's sort of really, a you know, is that a tricky conversation to have? Or is that something that builders should just go, yep, here you go, look I at all my... I feel like um, at the tender stage, a builder wouldn't have any issues. They, some of them might use the same subcontractors anyway, but... I feel like, you know, if they're a quality builder, they're going to share at least two to three subcontractors, a painter or a spark that they will potentially yeah. use for the site um, and, the, and the you know, and discuss the price. I feel like 
if to if it means enough to them, then they'll they'll have no issues or qualms in mm. providing that information. But just being directly up front with them and saying, how are you guys going at the moment? It's tough out there. And have that conversation. Don't, you know, have that tough conversation first um, and don't tippy-toe around it. Just say, hey, listen, I'm putting a lot on the line here. I know you, you yes. potentially are too. Or ask them if they have any ideas on how you can improve the site or make it work for both of you. And they, and they will, for sure. Yeah, yeah, because they want – well, first they want the, the, the job and want to be able That's to right. complete complete it as well. And what and, – and then speaking to the builders around, you know, their cash flow or whichever, and if you had to, to request for financials or financial statements or, or, or whichever, what would you be specifically be looking for? You, you want to make sure that – well, insurance is a big one. Um, the builder needs you need to make sure that the builder hasn't taken on so much work that they're not insured for your actual work. Mm. So it's very important to uh, find out off the builder what they're insured for. I think most you know renos or um, smaller developments, a builder will be uh, insured for around the twenty million dollar mark. But mm. bigger developers, um, you know, they they need to be insured for a lot more. So uh, make sure they're insured um, to take on the work, which is very important um, in terms of cash flow. You need to make sure they've got funds available to provide uh, to pay the subcontractors. Uh, it's happened to us before where a builder has gone under. Um, we could start. We started seeing the signs well probably late now because we had subcontractors stealing materials off site and, um, and 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 literally equipment off site. And we'd go up to him and say, "What's going on?" Well, he hasn't paid me. Um, <laughs> what's going on? So uh, you know, you need. It's crucial for a builder to be in a position that he hasn't exposed himself to too many jobs where he's relying on too many big payments to come in and to pay the subbies. Um, that that will help when um, you do ask to speak to a few subcontractors or a few companies that that builder engages and ask, are you guys getting paid, you know, regularly? And if they're yeah. not, then there's an issue. You can highlight that pretty quickly. Yeah. And, and you know, particularly now, Again, guys, when you are going into build contracts and so on, it's not a bad idea to have, be having these conversations. Another good point is to um, go around to some of the sites that the builders are building and check out the activity that's on on site, making sure 100%. there are, are trades there, have a bit of a chat to them as well if you're allowed to. Uh, just really seeing that there's activity as well if a builder wants your work which they should um generally they'll you know they'll be they'll take you around and show you some finishes on different sites they've done different projects they've done and yeah you'll see people on site and just say hey how you going you'll get a general vibe off them straight away yeah absolutely and then the next part was you mentioned getting the builder uh early on in terms of the planning and does that mean that you're, you, know, you guys specifically aren't going through a tender tender process? So well, you can actually engage builders at this stage and they might charge you a fee, they might not, um, but it doesn't guarantee them the job. Mm. Uh, what it does do though, it provides their experience and expertise at a stage in the development to ensure that you can best utilise everyone's skill set to achieve the best outcome for that project, uh, whether it's a change in material, whether it's, um, you know, a, a less engineered basement compared to an over-engineered basement. A, a, lot of, a lot of factors are at play that can be highlighted at that planning stage where you can save a significant amount of money. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, in, in short... It doesn't guarantee the builder, and I'd still go to a tender process for sure. Mm -hmm. um, but at that stage, they've got a their foot in the door because they've got a pretty good idea on where they need to be at to make it achievable for everyone. So it puts yeah. them in a good position, um, and it puts the uh, developer and the consultants and architects um, in a good position. At uh, Lion Property Group, you know, we use a company called Bailey Ward, and they are pretty. A very renowned architect in Melbourne and up in Queensland, um, Brisbane, Gold Coast. They don't 
you know, they want to have almost a say in who we choose to do our build our projects as well. Um, mm. Because mm. it's important that they can have what they're designing translated into a beautiful structure and they want to make sure that it's done to a T. So yeah. having all them discussions collectively and having them all know each other um, mm. or ask your architect who they recommend, it's probably a good good way to go about it too because, you know, they've delivered projects for them on their behalf. So I think, yeah, that would help a lot. And you also man, uh, mentioned value value management. Can you explain a bit about what that means? Yeah, for sure. So value management is engaging the architect and the builder, um, you know, and we'll have several meetings and go through the plans um, with a fine tooth comb collectively to work out where we can save uh, money on the project without impacting the uh, integrity of the design or the structure. Um, for example, if, you know, a massive I-30 beam, you can change the size of it and still get the same result. Um, a, a building material, a different colour brick or a different type of brick, you can change that out for, yeah. for, a, uh, for another brick um, and, and get the this, this same design aesthetic. Um, a, making a pool depth less, you can save a lot of money by not having such a deep pool. Um, okay, yeah. A, a basement. Um, is it a wet basement or is there alternatives around around that to um, mm. you know help help save you money and as i mentioned it's important none of this affects the integrity of the design or the build it doesn't change the aesthetic or the quality in the design um, but there is definitely ways you can yeah save money um, and by saving money it's value managing yeah yeah so being able to say this is what we need to work towards hello my assistant for tonight I think it's a good time. <laughs> uh, but the, being able to have that builder involved on the side. Okay. And, and having, <laughs> excuse me. Do well, you know where it is? You hit it. <laughs> he his iPad, so he's hunting for the iPad. So, mm. so going back, uh, it's saying, all right, builder, this is what we're working towards, basically having all their cards laid out to be able to say, if you want to be able to be part of this project, well, we need to be able to work with you. And it's a much more as opposed to, uh, what was it? it's almost like a blind auction otherwise. Correct. And and do, do you want to get to a stage where you've got the design, you're holding your cards up here, not giving them anything, and you want to get the best price off all these people and, and you're hiding everything from them? Um, I think collaboration is key. Uh, it's a big thing and big value of us at Lime Property Group. Um, from the investors through to our consultants, collaboration is crucial going forward. A lot of um, people might try to do developments themselves. If you've got an opportunity yes. to involve the right people and you set out the right structures, collaborate. Mm. Um, it's, it's far better. You can achieve a lot more. You can expand a lot more too. So. I think yeah. yeah, definitely try try to be open and you you'll find the builder who's you know being a bit dodgy or whatever they'll they'll, they'll disappear straight away if you're open and honest and yeah. you can yeah. and they'll show you the other sites and everything we've just spoke about. Um, I think it yeah yeah there's really yeah, really fantastic. good builders out there. Excellent. So engage your builder from the early stages, and that's it's another possible. part of managing managing your risk. In terms of cost and, and all that other other you know, avoiding one. avoiding variations as much as possible even from the very beginning. Correct. Uh, Correct. So number four. Um, number four. Quickly. So we've got the these ones are probably more just um, you know the economy and what's happening. So in managing the rising material costs, it's very hot topic at the moment. Um, so yeah, at the at number four, I've got material costs because yeah. if you don't haven't engaged, if you haven't got the land at a good price, if you haven't engaged the right builder, and then all these material costs are then added on top, and the builder can't have the cash flow to provide the material. What do you do? Do you help the builder? Do you don't help the builder? It all links um, yeah. together, and I think the inflation, which everyone's seeing right now, it's a it's a very um, hot topic at the moment. Um, yeah, so inflation and materials is a, is a big one. So materials for the last, for at least the last year and year and a bit, materials costs 
delays, shortage of labor. All that correct. Yeah. All the fun, all the fun things that have happened all at yeah. once, COVID and everything. How have you guys managed those in your projects? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question. Um, and it's only now that you can look back and realize how you have managed it because mm. in us as a developer, this has been ongoing or the shortage of materials, delays um, of materials has been hasn't happened the last six months like a lot of the media is talking about now. We saw this 18 months ago. Um, so the way we dealt with that and the way it's been dealt with, um, it's not a, it's the way everyone's kind of dealing with it at the moment, which probably yeah. creates the delays and shortages, which is pre-purchasing the material. For example, um, the builder usually might, you know, put down 10%, purchase a material or a deposit, yeah. get, get the material and chip away at it. Now um, we've kind of worked through a stage, which is kind of to go back to how it was, but we're still at this point where you need to buy all the steel for your 24 townhomes at once, or you need to buy all your windows at once and mm. you need to um, have everything ready to go. Um, that's where the lenders have also been very helpful. So that trickles down. So the lender, we they've changed how they lend money now um, through progress claims, but if there's an invoice there to get that project off the ground, the, you can go to your lender and say, hey, um, we need to pay for all this now to secure this, the equipment or yeah. whatever we need for the site. Um, so prepaying, what that has caused though is the delays in materials. So yeah. certain developers and bigger developers might have actually got the product they need. However, that trickling down to you know the person who's not paying up front who only requires a little amount, um, who doesn't have 18 projects simultaneously going, um, it, it, can, it can definitely trickle down and affect the, uh, I suppose, the mum and dad developers or, or people not developing on a bigger scale uh, yes. because they're not getting that access, which is not their fault at all. It's just it makes it a lot harder to get access like that to those suppliers. Um, you know, does a supplier want to give someone you know, one house or three townhouses, or are they going to give some a developer who's got 20 sites, 40 houses and two luxury homes? Yeah. And, you know, getting the lender in. So, I, and what, what's that, what's happened there though, is it's um, created a kink in the supply chain. Uh, and I can relate it directly to the toilet paper theory where there was no shortage of toilet paper, but everyone bought toilet paper at once. Mm. Um, everyone stockpiled toilet paper. By doing that, they we created our own supply shortage. Whereas if people kind of didn't go down that path, perhaps we wouldn't have seen so many kinks in the chain, in the supply yeah. chain. Um, yeah. But we don't know. Uh, in terms of line property group and how we manage it, that's how we did it. We were able to purchase or we knew what was coming up. So we knew um, the dishwasher, we knew the toilets, we knew and we were just buying as much as we could at that time. Um, and storing it and putting it aside and baths, everything you can think of uh, to yeah. get because we've seen it happening and we had to anticipate that rush and um, that's how we managed it at that time. Yeah. It's definitely eased off a bit now. 100% it's eased off so much. Mm. Now. Mm. Mm. And you mentioned as well the, the swap from timber to steel in yes. your projects. Yeah. Yep. How, yep. how, how was that? How was that managed and the logistics around that? Because that's happened to a lot, you know, a lot of people in the group as well. They've had to go, oh, my goodness, can't get any timber, won't be any timber for months. We've got to find a solution. Yeah, so much so. One of our builders actually bought a fabrication machine um, and started fabricating the steel for the projects. Um, we definitely on multiple sites went from we were going to in timber then to steel then back to timber, back to steel. Um, what you have to account for that when you're doing that is the foundations on them sites have to have be different or certain integrities depending what framing um, material you're going to use. So, you know, it was a bit of a stuff around where you've got to get the engineer back in to do the foundation or the engineering for the foundations again because you're changing from timber to steel. It needs to be a different integrity um, and stuff like that. But so it was, it was a headache, but it needed to be a quick shift that happened on a lot of our sites where we went from timber to steel, stuck with steel, um, 
And not only did it save us on the price of the escalation in timber, but it actually worked out better for the bottom line of the whole project, um, which, mm. which is fortunate. And before then, we really didn't have many projects that were built out of steel, to be honest. It was, the majority of it was timber. And so, was that just um, because it's just the way, just the product, yeah, you know, just the material you used for the, it's what the, the builder, time. Yeah, it's what the builder wanted to use. He was happy to use it. And, yeah, that's what we did for a long time, correct. Yeah. yeah. I know I know. there's a lot of steel out there um, in terms of pre prefabbed homes and, um, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the volume builders smack some steel frames up pretty quickly. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, it's and there's some sites with combination of both now. And, yeah, it's, it's yeah. amazing how you can adapt and manoeuvre where you need to be at certain periods in time to make something work and keep that integrity and aesthetic design aesthetic in place. And how quickly were you able to make that shift? Because like I said, you need to go back to engineering and, and, and all of that, like in terms of the overall project, if you looked at it and you went, Oh my goodness, it's going to take, was it weeks? Was it months? To, to be able There's to weigh a, out whether it was worth going yeah. through that process or not? It's a good question. It was at least a three-month process. At this stage, um, this is probably a good 12 to 18 months ago, that stage when this was happening to us or when we started seeing it, builders started quoting your projects out of timber and another builder would quote it out of steel. So you'd actually see the difference in the prices of both. Mm -hmm. um, one builder wanted to do timber and then we'd suggest, oh, what if we do steel? And then they provide another quote. The longer it took, the more price escalation we were seeing. So you had to be pretty quick to lock it down because they might have tended the you know price four weeks ago, but two weeks later it went up bang even more. So yeah, and then we're back to that's what I'm meant by steel timber, steel timber. Um, mm. It was a bit of a juggle at one stage, but it was at least three months. If you, by the time you committed, we almost had to have all the steel, the deposits, and all the steel paid for to know and secure it. And then decide, okay, we're going with that. We need to re-engineer the drawings quickly to make them work for steel and then hit the ground running when it came to, um, yeah, putting it together with construction. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, the point here is being able to go, all right, we've got to go into solution finding mode. <laughs> timber, Correct. can't get timber for months. It's, the prices have gone up. What's our next best in and in saying that, I mean, I guess the the steel and timber prices have sort of almost evened out. At, yeah. Oh, yeah. For steel is probably more expensive now. I don't even know, but yeah, it's 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 crazy. Have you have you guys gone back to timber since I then? We'll be looking at timber very soon. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the where our projects are at, we aren't looking at timber, but there is we are still with steel, but we are seeing a shift in supply um mm -hmm. catching up now for sure and that's what yeah. it is it's just catching up the the supplies there the pine trees are there it's just being able to yeah. get it out to everyone in that yeah, period of time absolutely. absolutely and finally in terms of the top areas of risk that you see that developers need to consider um so are we are we at three or four four or five i mean so i've got interest rates which is obviously massive have we yeah. have we covered interest rates or is that what we we're touched going on to? interest rates very briefly at the very start in terms of land acquisition that's right and and how it would impact the the end product because you've got and consumers suppose, sort of buying. with materials delays and inflation i suppose interest rates are a big part of that and that's what these are more economic risk um mm -hmm. Interest rates can, uh, uh, you know, it's a very, it's probably the most hottest topic and I've saved it for last, but um, you've got to be mindful of what's happening in the market. Interest rates might affect um, someone purchasing a home and, you know, that person paying off that home for 30 years. In terms of property development, if you're buying the house and you're flipping it, you know, you can, you can make it work still. Um, if you're operating in the same markets or you're allowing it for your, you know, these hikes now, which everyone should be in their feasibilities. Um, yeah. If you set the interest rates higher and have a bigger contingency for it, you, you should be okay. Um, interest rates in terms of where we were at with private lending and lending, which is we mainly utilise private lending. Um, you generally have a fixed, you know, capitalised interest at your, you know, nines to 12% and that's it for the, 
total life cycle of the project. So interest rates for us personally or line property group or developers aren't massive. Where it can hurt a project is the sales and mm -hmm. what product you're bringing to market. For example, are you bringing a $750,000 property to market, multiple, say six to 10, um, and who's purchasing them or investors purchasing them that maybe don't look at interest rates that much, don't require too much capital? Or is it a first home buyer who's borrowing at 90% LVR? Mm. And are they buying off the plan? If they're buying off the plan and they've got to wait 12 to 18 months and when they first acquired the site, they might have paid 750 and then it's gone up. The, the values have gone up. They haven't so much so dropped significantly yet. Certain areas have definitely. Um, the values 12 months ago went up um, to now and you know, you're stuck paying and the bank values like lower. So you're stuck paying a lot more money for that site to get in. And it can be very hard if you're, you know, 90% leveraged. It can yeah. be tough. That's a really good point you're making in terms of who in the market does generally get impacted by interest rate rises. And it will be those who set your first, first home buyers and, you know, like the luxury home market doesn't, particularly tend to really be rattled too much it doesn't seem well you wouldn't you wouldn't want to be um in the luxury home market and targeting you know the wealthier um people are, are, are they relying on the banks in you know in your two racks in melbourne um are, are they relying on you know your five percent differences in money or um I don't think they're that as leveraged or them suburbs aren't as leveraged as other suburbs. Mm. Um, it, it can be it can be quite difficult, but I feel like the it's, it can be a lot harder for first home buyers who've gone fully leveraged at 90%. Mm. The smallest mm. of changes can really impact their savings, their spendings and, and how they make payments. And then they're the ones that are stuck selling the house at a lower rate because they couldn't pay the, the payments. Hopefully yeah. not, though. We've experienced a lot of growth. I think everyone will be okay. I, the latest interest rate hike was at 2.5%. I don't like having an opinion on it, but um, I feel like it's it, it was required to go up because interest rates are at the lowest time they've ever been. Um, mm -hmm. Were people mm -hmm. able to get loans in that time during COVID? I don't think much money was given out in that COVID time because no one was working. Um, so did they even lend much money out of that very, very low percent? I don't know. What was the interest rate just before that? I think it was at this level we're at now. Um, a lot of the a lot of the fear around interest rates, I think it's healthy if they do go up. Um, it'd be good to see them at 5 to 6%, not the cash rate. That's interest rates. Uh, yeah. And I think that's a bit more feasible for everyone um, yeah. and a bit more, I suppose, healthier for the economy. And a healthy economy will be okay. Um, yeah, I Absolutely. But what does this mean for the developer in terms of mitigating that if you are targeting that first home buyer market and that's where your product is and it's it's you know it's you're starting to see it going, oh, you know, people are not not being able to settle. I mean, have you been through you know, have you guys been through that sort of scenario before or something similar where you go, This is what we've been able to do to 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 be honest, at the moment, the projects that are coming up for sale have already seen so much growth in the last mm. 24 months. Um, for example, the 600K property is now $800,000. If it, you know, we wow. settle for $700,000, the money's still in the project. Mm. Um, it's been a strange, strange time where we have seen so much growth. Um, everybody's talking about 5% crashes and property crashes and dropping 5%. We've witnessed um, 20 to 40% growth over the last 18 to 24 months. So mm -hmm. it does need to equal out a little bit how far out it does. I'm not sure. Um, it comes back to the suburbs you're developing in. I feel like there's a lot of micro markets within property that can definitely be impacted more than others. Um, but I feel like, yeah, in short, I haven't seen it impact us that much at the end of the day the individual needs to have their savings we were getting potentially money for nothing at a short period of time we realized that it's not sustainable let's make it achievable and i feel like 
people will start saving, putting more away and making it work as they did prior to COVID. So, yeah, yeah. So I guess that, that sort of follows on to my sort of almost like final questions to wrap, wrap things up. You know, there's a yes. lot of talk about doom and gloom and, you know, we're going to see our next sort of recession. How how are you guys? Here's my little guest again. Yes. Still still looking for still looking for something. Ooh, well, how are you guys doing things? Oh, are you guys doing anything different in terms of your projects going forward? Yeah. So COVID COVID probably woke the eyes up to um, a lot of things and at one stage it did separate people a lot more and push them away in terms of isolating in our homes but what it did was with technology it brought people a lot closer mm. um, we started working a lot closer with our consultants and valuing those relationships a lot more um, yeah. those relationships uh, I suppose maybe forged or got stronger during tough times through COVID so we're able to help each other here and there and made the relationship stronger. So it brought us closer to our consultants, such as with our builders, as I was discussing earlier uh, mm -hmm. in the program, um, working close with the builders is very integral to the development. Um, and, and a team that we work with, so they've been through, it streamlines the process a lot more, just there's a lot more um, systematic. We're, we're on DocuSign all the time now. We, we're inking contracts flat out prior to COVID. Um, just small things like that. And it, and it's helped, it's helped a, a lot in terms of how we manage staff, how we manage consultants, how we manage developments. Um, you don't expect things to happen all at once um, or get your knickers in a knot because it's not happening all at once. You can say, okay, and be probably a bit more diplomatic about scenarios and different, different um, challenges arising. Um, I feel like in terms of, you mentioned the recession and doom and gloom and people preparing for that um you know there's there's the economic def definition of recession or what is it two two cycles down or two quarters down and we're in a recession um how does that affect the property market i feel like in australia now is a good time for people to take advantage of opportunities uh we're 200 we're 200 years young um we have a philosophy at our work that we can control our attitudes we can control how we visualize stuff, how we see things. And I feel like um, we choose to embrace positivity. Um, mm. It's huge. Um, and if you have that and your values are strong, you've got good relationships with your consultants, you'll be able to get through uh, what's ahead, whether that is a crash or how you, what, how do you, what's your definition of a crash? Like, I don't even, I don't even know, like, is an asteroid going to come down and smash one of our developments? Because to me, that's probably a crash um, for that site. But in terms of um, a market crash or it's, you know, it goes down, it's going to come back up if you just got to ride out the tough times. And I feel like the toughest times through work through COVID um, mentally, psychology, maybe not um, through money, but uh, mentally and psychologically, I feel like we were um, almost trained to get through the next tough time, yeah. which looks like it's going to be a more financial battle. Um, but at the end of the day, the government gave out so much money it created and inflated the market. Interest money was cheap. It needs to get back up. We've got to give that money back some way or another. It might have been good at the time, but it's, it wasn't sustainable. And now we need to work back um, towards that. And that's what we're. That's what the government, the RBA is doing now. They're raising interest rates to deal with the inflation and hopefully mm -hmm. get us back on the right track. Yeah, we've got we've got someone here mentioning. Uh, it's commenting recessions provide the best opportunities. Be greedy when others are fearful. Warren, Warren Buffett, what a man. Good old um, Warren, so, Warren Buffett. Yeah. And, and we've been through so many cycles. It's, it's, it's another part of the property cycle. And we've seen to, when we look at the long-term property cycle, right, it's always increased. We've had dips and all of that. But then to be able to go, okay, what can we learn from, you know, we had the GFC. We had, you know, all these other really impactful sort of dips in the market we've been able to recover. And it just means that, you know, the, the reason why we're, we're talking about risk and managing that is that that's what development's about. 
the whole time yeah. it's around finding solutions it's all about managing all the different sorts of risks and then right. you know, be mindful about the types of projects that you are entering into if you sort of feel that it's a market where you know am i catering to first home buyers are they actually the market that can write out this 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 cycle well great if you don't feel they are then target a different market where you feel are going to be less or a different or a different state or a different yeah, exactly. something um exactly. perth suffered. look at perth perth still struggling mm-hmm. from the mining boom um did victoria did melbourne sydney see that i don't think so um up in darwin darwin's booming at the moment tasmania is going crazy um just broaden your horizons maybe i think COVID also did that for us it helped us look outside the box a little bit more um there's uh, there's opportunities in a booming market there's opportunities in a recession there's opportunities everywhere you've just got to be able to find them um yeah. and i think it's just having having a, a broad view of all of it and sitting back having a look read the play and then have a crack but yeah um that gentleman or um whoever left that comment is 100 percent right be fearful when everyone's greedy be greedy when everyone's uh fearful um because that's when you'll get the most growth and where you can catch up time. Absolutely. Sure. That's a great way to, to wrap things up. Brenton, it's been fantastic. For those of you who would like to reach out to Brenton, have a chat around what they're doing in Lion Property Group. We've got his email out here somewhere. It'll flash across the screen pretty soon. My magic's not quite working as quickly as I'd like. All right, it will come up. Oh, good. <laughs> it's okay. great, but it, Thank you. I mean, I think we've, we've really highlighted uh, some really valuable information here, uh, a lot for us to think about in terms of not just our current projects, but the projects that are coming up. Um, lionproperty.group is the website. Yeah. And that will come on when it does. And in terms of if anyone wants to reach out to you, you're obviously on Facebook, but your email, brenton.s. Right? At Lion Property. At Lion yep, Property. Yep, group. So it's all dot. group, no dot com, but you'll look us up. Find us, yeah, you'll find us. Um, on the again, just thanks for having me on the show, Cheryl. Really no, hope um, the members in this group, I love the group, to be honest. I love commenting on people's success stories and people putting progress photos up. Keep up the good work, guys. And we're all, we are all in it together, so um, it's good. And if you can collaborate, definitely collaborate. Absolutely. There's so much to learn from each other. And this is the whole point of this group was to really empower, support, and, you know, we all share and grow together. Um, Correct. You know, Australia is not that big and our community is not that huge, but we all in some way or form that can impact each other. So I really appreciate all your share. You've got a podcast as well. So if you, people want to watch your videos, where do they go to? Uh, not so much a podcast, but I do videos on YouTube channels and just like, you know, talk about risk and upcoming risk and just yeah. stuff that might add value to people at different times instead of just talking about what we do and what we have to offer and our opportunities. We like to share um, what's happening in the market. So LinkedIn is probably the best one for me. Just look up my name on LinkedIn and I'll share that content on LinkedIn. But yeah, it, shoot through an email if you want to have a chat, a one-on-one. Um, more than happy to organize that too and yeah, exactly what you said. Um, we're all here in it together. So I think we're a very young country and there's a lot of growth to happen. It's very exciting. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I hear that you're, hopefully your bubba's gone to sleep. I don't hear yes. yes. <laughs> hopefully I'm both of them are. That's right. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Oh, take care very much. Thanks very Thanks, much guys. Again for joining us, everyone that's come on board. Make sure you visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel, The Business of Property, where you can find all our past episodes and the replay of this particular session. If you found value, make sure you hit the like button and the little thumbs up. And so we'll see you again next time. Keep well. Take care. See you soon. Bye-bye.